As night falls, Kathy and Stanton arrive at the abduction site only days after the 47th anniversary of the event. When Stan and I were beginning our interview, you drew our attention to something behind us in the sky. Motors running on two vehicles. What do we have here? Obviously, what happened last night was a little bizarre. I wanted to show you guys the footage and uh, get your reactions to it now. For example. Even with the motors running on two vehicles. Yeah. What do we have here? Well, that's rather interesting. <laughs> I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere here. That's really nowhere. I don't know what to make of it. I've never seen anything move like that. You know, and, and it matches the description that we heard last night from, from other people who observed this. Yeah. For some reason, New Hampshire does seem to be a state that has had a lot of UFO activity. They're taking me up to the object. I go up the ramp. I don't want to go on it. Although Dr. Simon conducted the session separately and induced amnesia at the end of each session, Betty and Barney's stories of the abduction match to the smallest detail. Of course, the, the thing that stands out in my mind is Barney when he's looking through the binoculars and he sees the craft hovering over the ground. I mean, that poor man was shook up. Um, you knew he was just terrified. The psychiatrist had given them the audio tapes to take home and listen to them, thinking that might help reduce the trauma. But they didn't want to listen to them alone. Just before the point on the tape where Barney starts screaming, I gotta get out of here, and runs back to his car, the physical Barney jumped up and ran out in our kitchen and vomited in our sink. And I thought that would be pretty hard to fake. I try to maintain control so Betty cannot tell I am scared. God, I'm scared. It's all right. I got to get my gun. <laughs> Perhaps the most intriguing evidence to emerge from the hypnosis is Betty's simple drawing of a map, which she understood to be the home of the alien beings. Astronomer Marjorie Fish spent years constructing three-dimensional models of known star configurations, attempting to identify and authenticate the map. Because here's Betty, who had no background in astronomy and that kind of thing, and, and uh, she draws this map and nobody can tell where it goes. Marjorie Fish tries to put it into a, a, a normal star configuration that, that she could find, nothing matches. And lo and behold, when our astronomers find these two stars, they put it in the star catalog and bingo, perfect. That's exactly what Betty drew. Well, how did she do that? Years before it was even into the catalog. You know, that to me is, is very telling, I think. That's pretty convincing evidence. Yeah, I mean, you know, how do you fight that? You can't. You know, I, how could she know? Chemist Phyllis Budinger has performed a detailed chemical analysis of unusual stains on the dress Betty wore the night of the abduction. The stains are all that remain on areas of the dress that were once covered in a strange pink substance where the beings touched the dress. Phyllis Budinger is a world-class chemist. Phyllis cuts swaths from the dress 
and uh, took them to her laboratory in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and analyzed them over uh, a two-year period. I found that there was a, a protein-type substance which I could relate to mold, but the fact that on all the stain samples that was on the outside shows that this did not come from Betty. This was a secondary product, uh, obviously mold that had grown on something that had been there previously and possibly from the abduction. And we can see okay. that right here. Yeah, yeah, especially here. Yeah, oh yes, right see there here? as well. Yeah. In some ways, uh, the speculation would support Betty's story. Whoever heard of a film company filming two ufologists <laughs> on a UFO <laughs> show? <laughs> no, it did not look like stars. Okay. It looked like one dot and another one, like this, and then they disappeared, and then one showed up, and this one disappeared, another one showed up, this one disappeared, and it just repeated itself. And they were like a light bulb color, like a tint of yellow, and another one of our servers saw something like this a couple of days ago, too. Oh. In the same area. So what's happening in New Hampshire? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to call it alien. It was something strange. Betty and Barney had always intended for their UFO sighting and then their abduction to remain confidential. They didn't need negative publicity in their life. And coming forward with this, what I thought was very brave of them to do. UFOs were not considered a very highbrow topic, to say the least at that time. They expected to lose their jobs. And Barney was very active in civil rights, of course, and he, the last thing he needed was some silly story about flying saucers. They had told only a few scientists, and, and the material was to be handled as confidential material. After the truth was revealed through a violation of confidentiality, Betty and Barney agreed to talk publicly for the first time. John Fuller, an author and UFO researcher, convinced them to tell the true story of their experience. The book became a New York Times bestseller. It was published in several different languages. They were actually surprised to find that uh, it was more widely accepted than they anticipated it would be. Betty and Barney achieved quite, quite a degree of fame, fame that they never sought. After Barney died, Betty devoted more of her time to UFO research and UFO investigation and did seem to have later encounters. This is a photograph that Betty took of a craft that she said was hovering above her vehicle. And uh, you can see that it appears to be saucer shaped. And uh, there's something in the window there. And there seems to be evidence that UFOs actually did land on my grandparents' farm. This was the goat house. <laughs> I can remember in the middle of the night hearing this huge bang that actually knocked me out of bed. So my brother and I went down in the field and we, we found this area that all the trees were sheared off about probably 20 feet up and there was a huge triangle Im imprint in the ground. And I can remember my brother reached down and grabbed some uh, white birch bark that was all curled up and singed and when he grabbed it he went ah and like he burnt his hand. My grandparents house rattled and they got up looked out of the window and did see like a huge glowing moon outside. So there does seem to actually be some kind of connection bizarre as it is between Betty and these later sightings. We can no longer say that this was a fantasy. Here we have evidence that it was an actual physical experience. I have 
picked up the torch and continued Betty's fight because I think that her credibility is worth defending. Although Dr. Simon conducted the session separately and induced amnesia at the end of each session, Betty and Barney's stories of the abduction match to the smallest detail. Of course, the, the thing that stands out in my mind is Barney when he's looking through the binoculars. You know, and, and it matches the description that we heard last night from, from other people who observed this. Yeah. For some reason, New Hampshire does seem to be a state that has had a lot of UFO activity. It's, it's taking me up to the object. I go up the ramp. I don't want to go on. As night falls, Kathy and Stanton arrive at the abduction site only days after the 47th anniversary of the event. When Stan and I were beginning our interview, you drew our attention to something behind us in the sky. Motors running on two vehicles. Yeah. What do we have here? Well, that's rather interesting. <laughs> I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere here. That's really nowhere. I don't know what to make of it. I've never seen anything move like that. What do we have here? Obviously, what happened last night was a little bizarre. I wanted to show you guys the footage and uh, get your reactions to it now. Even with the motors running on two vehicles. 